Throughout most of history, ghosts were simply an assumed fact. Ancient cultures, such as the Egyptians and Mesopotamians, regarded communication and interaction with the spirits of the dead as a common occurrence, though the latter tended to believe in more malicious forms than the former. The Canaanites believed ghosts could be prayed to for intercessions and favors, while the Greeks during the time of the poet Hesiod believed heroic people walked the earth as good spirits, and those who suffered a violent death spent their afterlife sowing discord. In the Gospel of Matthew, the disciples of Jesus mistook him for a spirit, which was somewhat understandable since the Son of God was in the process of traversing the sea on foot. In the first book of Samuel, a king named Saul speaks with the ghost of the prophet Samuel, who seems less than pleased with the whole affair. A post-enlightenment time traveler would probably be met with complete bemusement at his declaration to the temporal natives that ghosts aren't real. Of course, such a declaration would have more going for it than against, regardless of the prevailing opinion. Philosophically, our hypothetical chrononaut could argue ghosts aren't real from a simple materialistic standpoint. Death is a one-way trip to oblivion, the biological equivalent of tripping a circuit breaker on a countertop toaster. Once the power is out, the appliance becomes nothing more than an inert block of metal and plastic, doomed to break down into nothingness over the lifetime of the universe. Optimists need not apply. Others might argue against the concept of ghosts on a more theological level, and question why a creator would condemn souls to wander the earth, when they are either presumably saved and destined for heaven, or due for an eternity of torment. This, of course, assumes one can know the motivations of a divine creator, and that souls of the dead do not retain some form of agency, and therefore do not decide their own fate. Of the paranormal subjects caught on film, ghosts have the honor of being the first, some of the earliest such photos being taken by Boston engraver and photographic innovator William Mumler in the mid-19th century. Mumler had stumbled into the field of ghost photography purely by accident. A self-portrait contained an apparition of a long-deceased cousin, though this was almost certainly a double exposure of an existing image. Eventually, he created a cottage industry catering to the bereaved. In April of 1896, Mumler was tried for fraud and larceny, testimony against him partially provided by famed showman Phineas Taylor Barnum, who claimed Mumler had burgled his victims' homes in order to steal photos of dead relatives to aid in his deceptions. Though Mumler was acquitted due to insufficient evidence, his reputation was damaged beyond repair. One would seem entirely justified in dismissing ghost photography, based entirely on William Mumler's misadventures. But one man's deception hardly closes the door on an intriguing possibility, capturing the image of a ghost, something widely considered real throughout history, on film. We should be careful not to throw the proverbial baby out with the bogus bathwater. As with any phenomenon, ghost photographs can be broadly classified by genre. These are, of course, somewhat open to interpretation, as is the meaning of the term ghost. These genres include amorphous shapes, unexplained densities, such as a streak or orb of light across an exposure, unexplained fogs, defined images, usually of a human face or form, and unexplained shadows. These genres can be further differentiated into one of three types, based on location and context. Type 1 photos are those that originated during a pre-planned structured event, such as a seance. These photographs generally depict an apparition of someone emotionally connected to one or more of the participants, such as a dead relative or lover. Notably, the exchange of money is typically part of the creation of Type 1s. A spirit medium, or someone equivalent, is charging clients for a glimpse into the afterlife, and a substantiating photo would certainly justify the price, as bereaved or fascinated individuals would probably be too suggestive to cry fraud. Type 2 photos are those taken in a less contrived setting, often where one would traditionally expect to find ghosts, something like a graveyard, abandoned asylum, or rumored to be haunted house. Although these are typically taken by someone with a vested interest in the subject, the motivation is often less about direct monetary gain and more about enhancing reputation. A team of ghost hunters with images of some phantasm, whether authentic or not, will undoubtedly gain credibility in the eyes of the public. Type 3 photos depict something that most viewers would identify as a ghost, but taken in a candid setting of a non-paranormal subject without any intent of capturing anything unusual. A mysterious face peeking out from behind grandma at a family reunion, or a translucent man sitting in what was thought to be an empty automobile being two generalized examples. Financial gain is not typically a motive behind Type 3 photos, as by definition they are claimed to be unintended. 
Photographers are often said to be shocked or confused when these photos are developed, for obvious reasons. Of course, an individual could manipulate the image or the subject of the image to fake the existence of a ghost, and some undoubtedly have. The following is a sampling and analysis of what are widely considered, at least at one time, authentic Type 2 and Type 3 ghost photographs. Some are not easily explained, some are likely misidentifications, and some are very probable hoaxes. Type 1 photographs are not considered, as very few, if any, of these images are difficult to explain prosaically. The vast majority are the result of zealous spiritualists selling the idea of life after death to hopeful clients. Although latitude has been given in the analysis of each case, as there is really no way to prove beyond all doubt that a ghost photograph is not what it appears or is claimed to be, any conclusions implied or stated are ultimately only an informed opinion. Explanations based on completely non-physical means, such as the photographer's strong emotions psychically imprinting a ghostly form onto a photo, are also avoided. One cannot say with absolute certainty something to this effect isn't going on, but unless we limit our open-minded inquiry to conventional earthly theories, we risk having our minds spill completely out of our heads. Viewers are free to disagree with any conclusions, and are encouraged to offer alternatives within the comments. Although by no means the earliest ghost photograph, the so-called brown lady photograph taken in Raynham Hall is probably the most well-known to the general public and probably one of the most analyzed during the 20th century. For the better part of 400 years, Raynham Hall in Norfolk, England was the home of the Townsend family. Around the turn of the 18th century, the young doe-eyed Dorothy Walpole, sister of Robert Walpole, the first Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, married Charles, the second Viscount of Townsend, who was known by the odd nickname of Turnip, due to his enthusiasm for growing turnips as a rotational crop. It is said Turnip was a very jealous and unpleasant man, and his discovery of the Lady Dorothy's marital infidelity sent him into a tirade of epic proportions. As retribution, he permanently locked the young woman into an apartment within the manor, where she eventually died in 1726 of either smallpox, a tumble down the stairs, a syphilis infection, or from self-induced starvation. The ghost of the Lady Dorothy has supposedly been seen on several occasions since, the first known sighting by a Charles Loftus during late 1835. Loftus, who had been staying at Raynham Hall during Christmas celebrations, witnessed the ghost traversing the hall near his bedroom on two successive nights, noting in particular the quaint brown-colored dress she wore and ghoulish vacant eye sockets. The following year, Captain Frederick Marriott, a well-regarded Royal Naval officer and successful novelist, supposedly encountered the brown lady in a corridor of the manor, and undoubtedly, in a moment of stark terror, discharged a revolver directly into the ghost's face. It is worth noting a portrait of the Lady Dorothy was hanging in his bedroom at the time, the gaze of which, incidentally, was said to follow onlookers, a claim which smacks of equal parts campfire cliché and tourist trap. At just after 8 a.m. on September 19th of 1936, professional photographer Indra Shira, his wife, the well-known London psychic and palmist Madame Indra Shira, and Captain Provand, art director for Indra Shira Limited, court photographers, arrived on the grounds of Raynham Hall. According to later accounts, Mr. Shira had been commissioned by Country Life magazine to make a photographic survey of the hall and its environs. This claim is somewhat dubious. The Marchioness Gladys Townsend stated the Shiras contacted her via post several weeks earlier regarding their intentions, and that they were only allowed access on a day ordinarily reserved for the public. It is perhaps telling the Marchioness was known to have found the trio to be distasteful and pushy, especially Madame Indra Shira, who kept up a constant sycophantic chatter. Although later statements regarding the three ghost hunters made by her daughter, the Lady Elizabeth Townsend, are much more congenial. At about 4 p.m. on the day in question, Mr. Shira and Mr. Provand had readied their equipment for two exposures of a beautiful oaken staircase, Provand steadying his camera with an attached sasha light, an early type of photographic flash, against a marble table or pillar. Provand took one photograph, after which Mr. Shira excitedly shouted that he had seen something on the staircase. Quote, After the flash and on closing the shutter, Captain Provand removed the focusing cloth from his head, and turning to me, said, What's all the excitement about? 
I directed his attention to the staircase and explained that I had distinctly seen a figure there, transparent so the steps were visible through the ethereal form, but nevertheless very definite. He laughed and said I must have imagined seeing a ghost." Unquote. The men took a few more pictures and returned to their London studio, Provand wagering five pounds against the possibility of catching Shira's ghost on the negative. While developing the photographs, Provence supposedly grew so astonished at what he saw that he bolted downstairs to obtain the witness of Benjamin Jones, manager of a chemist shop. As one would expect, considering the longevity of the photo in supernatural circles, Jones saw the resulting image and concurred that the photo did indeed show something strange. This, of course, isn't really proof of anything. If the photo was somehow faked, Jones would simply be judging the quality of the final faked image, and would simply be the first to fall victim to a hoax. In any case, the photo set was subsequently published in the December 26th issue of Country Life magazine, whether or not it was actually commissioned, as well as Life magazine in the United States. As was undoubtedly intended, the ghost photo in particular became somewhat of a sensation. In January of the following year, two independent, nearly simultaneous investigations were launched, the first by representatives from the Society for Psychical Research, the final report of which was compiled by a Mr. C.V.C. Herbert, and the second by American psychoanalyst Dr. Nandor Fodder, along with his wife and daughter, paranormal researcher Harry Price, and a Mr. Arthur Kingston, professional camera maker. The camera used by Provand was a very old bellows type with a cloth shroud. This camera was in a bad state of disrepair, with the bellows split, allowing the possibility of unwanted light bleeding into the exposure. With this in mind, Herbert wasted no time in thoroughly examining the negatives. Quote, I saw the negatives of both exposures. The first, before the ghost appeared, was much underexposed. Exposure in each case was by daylight, highlights on the stairs, etc., assisted by sasha bulb. The second film, i.e. the one with the ghost, is obviously shaken in a vertical plane, causing doubling of all horizontal lines, or else in two exposures. Provence said he had noticed this, which surprised me, as it is very obvious even in the process block. Unquote. This is significant as it shows Provence is either extremely ignorant of the methods of proper photography, or he is unconcerned with wasting his time and materials to take a horribly bad photo. Herbert further describes the negatives of both exposures as showing a non-obvious circular marking, which appeared as a halo around, but strangely not centered upon, the ghost in the second. He notes that Shira, the only one of the two men to have actually seen anything, was unclear about the exact position of the ghost when he first saw it with his naked eye, as it was moving down the stairs toward their location, although he was certain the ghost had moved a total of ten steps. If the ghost was visible to Shira, it was presumably reflecting environmental light, which doesn't seem to be the case. And if the entire field of view was slightly duplicated because of vibration, why isn't the ghost also duplicated? Shira implies Provand was beneath the cloth shroud the entire time the two exposures were taken of the staircase, possibly as an explanation as to why Provand had not seen the ghost approach when Shira did. Considering the camera equipment used, this is simply not possible. As investigator Roger Morgan explains, quote, Focusing under the dark cloth was done with a ground glass screen, which had to be removed and the negative dark slide inserted. Then there was nothing to see, and the photographer would stand by the camera to take the exposure. Unquote. Provand would be standing beside the camera when exposing the film, not beneath the shroud. Even assuming the men's recollection of the events was clumsy and inaccurate for entirely innocent reasons, there was very little evidence anyone involved had any great depth of knowledge of photography, as the work produced by Provant is, in the SPR's opinion, amateurish. Worse still, the background of the two men was found by Herbert to be full of questionable details. It is very likely the name of Mr. Indra Shira was a pseudonym, possibly borrowed from his wife, who was fairly well known in spiritualist circles. Madame Shira herself claimed the surname meant Mother of Millions, an obvious falsehood. Indra is of Hindi origin, meaning splendid, and Shira is Hebrew, meaning my song. Contemporary London directories do not include Indra Shira Limited Court Photographers at 49 Dover Street in Piccadilly, the business address used by Mr. Shira and Mr. Provand, but instead list the office of a solicitor named William Marshall. Could Indra Shira and William Marshall be one and the same? This idea is further teased by the name of the chemist's shop downstairs, Blake, Marshall, and Blake. Marshall is not a particularly uncommon name, but the coincidence does seem odd. 
Shira and Provand were known to display photos in the chemist's shop window, as well as the sidewalk outside, where they would offer them for sale at up to one guinea per copy. The captain, Provand, did not actually hold any military rank, only having briefly taught photography in the British Navy during World War I. It is likely he used this affectation to lend himself social credibility, which, although hardly proof of any wrongdoing, does indicate a willingness to bend the truth. Amateurish or not, Provand was at one time a reasonably successful professional photographer and did have experience, although by the end of the 1920s he had gone bankrupt and he, like Shira, had likely never been a court photographer of any kind, although the studio of bona fide court photographer Bassano Limited was located nearby. Although Herbert ultimately thought both Shira and Provand honest, he was unable to account for any anomalies in the negatives and assumed that the cracked bellows on the camera had simply let in too much light. By Dr. Fodder's account, there was little difficulty in replicating the circumstances and lighting of the photo, but there was no success in duplicating the ghost, thinking that some trick of reflection might have caused a humanoid shape to appear to both an observer's eye and a waiting camera lens. A photograph was taken of Dr. Fodder as he stood on the 13th step, and a second was taken of his wife doing the same, afterwards comparing the result to the image on Provence's negative. Fodder determined, quote, The size of the latter is about right for a shorter female figure, unquote. This is interesting when one considers the fact that Madame Shira was also present during the 1936 session, yet her whereabouts are strangely glossed over in Shira and Provence's recollection. Could she have been used as a stand-in for a ghost? While not impossible, this seems unlikely when considering other information. The stair treads are known to be about 4 foot 3 inches in width, approximately the height of the ghost, when rotated as a comparison. This is not an unheard of height for women now nor in 1936, but it is unusually short. During the time of the original photo, the average height of an adult woman was around 5 foot 3 inches. One puzzle mentioned by Fodder, about which the SPR investigation seems to have been strangely silent, is why the ghost does not appear blurred in the photo. Each of Provence's exposures was approximately six seconds. Shira indicated the ghost traveled the distance of about ten steps. The ghost should therefore be blurred, its movement prominently captured on the second exposure. No real explanation was given for this discrepancy, although it is possible the ghost was only reflecting enough light to be captured at the tail end of its descent. After their visit, Dr. Fodder and Price both publicly vouched for the photo's authenticity, unable to find suitable evidence for fraud. As both were known to be enthusiastic proponents of paranormal beliefs, this should come as no surprise. An interesting fact regarding the Brown Lady photograph is that at no time during Provence or Shira's account is the name Dorothy Walpole, the term Brown Lady, or any implication thereof actually used. Although the photo has come to be known as the Brown Lady of Raynham Hall, the association is likely due to a later assumed connection to the most famous of the myriad hauntings at the property. It is very possible Shira and Provand believed they had captured some other spirit, since the hall had a century-long storied history of ghostly encounters, everything from mysterious children to spectral dogs and crimson-coated cavaliers. It was the opinion of Marchioness Gladys Townsend that the ghost shown in the photo taken by Provand was not in fact a ghost at all, but a beautiful apparition of the Virgin Mary. She even declared as much to Dr. Fodder during his visit, which unlike the visit from the Shiras and Provand was quite welcome, as Dr. Fodder had been a good friend of hers for some time. This is a very interesting bit of minutiae when one considers the Marchioness was an extremely devout Catholic, even having established a religious shrine beneath the staircase in the famous photo. When viewed in this context, one can almost make out the flowing robes and pious pose often seen in religious statues. This is ultimately a matter of opinion, of course, but it does strongly suggest a possible source and motivation for a double exposure. Very few still regard the so-called Brown Lady photo to be anything more than a clever fake. Nevertheless, the image is a favorite of top ten lists and books on the paranormal, and because of its age and reputation will undoubtedly be regarded as one of the best ghost photos for the foreseeable future. Perhaps the Lady Dorothy and others do in fact haunt the corridors of Raynham Hall. Considering the odd discrepancies, however, the famed photo from 1936 is probably not evidence to the effect. Wellington Henry Stapleton Cotton, the second Viscount of Combermere, generally referred to as Lord Combermere, died on December 1, 1891 at the ripe age of 73 from an arterial embolism. 
A funeral was held at the St. Margaret's Anglican Church in Renbury, Cheshire, England. A large crowd had gathered to pay respects during the relatively brief service, ending in the mid-afternoon with the interment of the Viscount's remains. Two miles away, a woman by the name of Sybil Corbett prepared to take a photograph of the impressive but dimly lit library at Combermere Abbey, said to be one of the late Viscount's favorite rooms. Aware the concurrent funeral services would mean the abbey would be more or less vacant for much of the day, Ms. Corbett set her camera for a one-hour exposure and left, confident her efforts would remain undisturbed. Eight months later, Ms. Corbett at last developed the plate and was immediately confronted with a very odd sight. In the lower left corner of the image, the translucent head, arms, and torso of a human figure seemed to be sitting in a large, high-backed armchair. Miss Corbett's sister, Alice Rowley, was certain the figure was the Lord Combermere, which was an impossibility, as a diary notation made by Corbett confirmed the date and time of the exposure, the day and hour of Lord Combermere's funeral. Several other friends and family who examined the photo thought the figure looked nothing like the man. Then again, despite the visual confusion caused by the chair's carved decoration, one can see what appears to be a white or blonde beard just above the neckline, a feature not shared by any of the clean-shaven men that were known to be in the abbey at the time of exposure, the butler, two footmen, and Ms. Corbett's younger brother. Did Lord Combermere leave his own funeral to sit for a photo? Many reproductions and articles hold the Combermere photo in high regard, generally touting it as one of the best, most inexplicable ghost photos ever taken. In 1895, the photo was examined by physicist William F. Barrett. Barrett soon interviewed Sybil Corbett to learn more about the case. The photographic plate that had been used had been purchased in a sealed, ready-to-use state, pre-packaged and treated with dry emulsion. Ms. Corbett was quite certain she had not accidentally exposed the plate beforehand, and also noted that before the photo of the library, she was exclusively a landscape photographer, meaning there would be little to no chance of a person's image accidentally being on a plate to account for a double exposure. Moreover, the odds that a person photographed in a completely different setting and context would perfectly align with the library chair seemed absurd. With the help of a Mr. Gordon Salt, Professor Barrett performed a series of photographic experiments using a camera and exposure similar to Corbett's original. At some point during each exposure, one of the men sat in a chair and repeatedly shifted his legs. The result was an image of a very similar appearance to that taken by Corbett. It was of Barrett's opinion that an unknown man, probably someone who was visiting Combermere Abbey on the day of the funeral, had entered the library and sat in the chair, crossed his legs, and, noticing the camera, quickly rose and left the room. This theory is greatly supported from certain details in the Corbett photo. The position of the library chair is such that afternoon sun sweeps across the chair's right side. The head and arm of the ghost also appear to be illuminated on the right side, suggesting some physicality and ability to reflect light. The ghost is only visible from the torso up, which one would expect if a sitter's legs were moving nearly the entire time they were within the frame, i.e. turning to sit and then being crossed. Who the sitter could have been is an enduring mystery, but it seems likely that one of the hundreds of those that turned out for the Lord Combermere's funeral, perhaps a personal friend, visited the abbey unbeknownst to any of the servants, Ms. Corbett or her siblings, contemplatively wandered the halls and rooms, entered the library and sat down to rest and reflect on life and the passage of time. The instant he noticed the camera and realized he may be ruining someone's carefully composed shot, he bid a hasty retreat. Despite the long exposure, the relatively brief time for the stranger to enter and exit the frame, whether from the right or the left, would not necessarily be enough to imprint on the film, especially if he wasn't well lit for most of the time. While a recreation of an unexplained photograph, such as that produced by Professor Barrett and Mr. Salt, does not necessarily prove the original is not what it claims to be, a recreation using plausible and non-exotic means does prove that the explanation for said photograph could be something other than paranormal. It seems the Lord Carmere photo could be a rare incident of a convincing mistake where none of the parties involved realized anything out of the ordinary was happening while it was happening. Coincidentally, the Lord Combermere's father, Sir Stapleton Cotton, served as governor of Barbados during the bizarre events surrounding the spinning coffins of the Chase family vault. In 1975, RAF Air Marshal Sir Robert Victor Goddard published a book entitled Flight Towards Reality, in which he describes in detail what is now widely claimed to be a photograph containing the partially obscured, ghostly face of a deceased air mechanic named Freddie Jackson. 
Note this is only a written description. No photographic plate accompanies this text. Quote, there he was, and no mistake, although a little fainter than the rest. Indeed, he looked as though he was not altogether there, not really with the group, for he alone was capless, smiling. All the rest were serious and set and wearing service caps. Most had not long returned from church parade and marching in a military funeral, for Freddie Jackson had, upon that very spot, the squadron tarmac, three days before, walked heedlessly into the whirling propeller of an airplane. He had been killed stone dead instantly. He, evidently, was still quite unaware of it." Unquote. The squadron, which, owing to the bureaucratic chaos of post-World War I England, was a hodgepodge of service branches and due to be disbanded back to civilian life. The group had just participated in a funeral, presumably that of Mr. Jackson, and were posing for a photograph to commemorate their time together. Although the photograph was intended for purely posterity's sake, posing for it was mandatory, hence each of the men and women are in uniform and cap. A representative from the Bassano Portrait Studio took the photograph and left immediately after. After development, the studio sent copies, which could be purchased by anyone, and negatives to the Cranwell Base Commander, Air Commodore Charles Longcraft. Supposedly, a copy was hung in the maintenance crew mess, after which the face of Freddie Jackson was discovered. Alerted to the possibility of a sick joke perpetrated on his men, Longcraft appointed two photographic analysts to independently examine the image. Neither found any evidence of tampering, either on the final print or on the associated negatives. Three quarters of a century later, in 1996, a 97-year-old widow named Bobby Capel, who had spent 18 months as a driver for the Wrens, the Women's Royal Naval Service, and who was in fact a friend of the aforementioned Victor Goddard, as well as one of the people in the photograph, shared a personal copy of the photo with Navy News, a British periodical. From there, the photo propagated throughout British and eventually worldwide media. Quote, I have no doubt the face peeping out from the back is Jackson. I can recall the general astonishment when the picture was pinned up. Unquote. The Freddie Jackson photo certainly is more intriguing than most, far removed from the typical frightful spirit in a dark room one can find infesting the internet. The idea of Freddie Jackson returning after meeting a horribly shocking fate with a warm smile on his face is bittersweet. One could imagine some of his loved ones even being comforted by the sight. But, intriguing or not, questions about the photo remain. Did Freddie Jackson exist? According to researcher Blake Smith, quote, I bought access to several online genealogy search engines, ultimately finding the right database to look for all the Brits with similar names who died in World War I. I found 26 similar names and only one direct match to Freddie Jackson, unquote. The direct match referred to is a Frederick William Jackson, a marine artilleryman, not an airplane mechanic, and a victim of heart failure, not a spinning propeller. In a subsequent investigation, Smith notes a death record of a George Frederick Jackson, an airplane mechanic who had died in a Sheffield hospital from an unspecified cause, a fact that doesn't mesh well with a known narrative, though this isn't really surprising. Searching century-old historical records for a specific individual is not a straightforward task, a man may be known as Freddy to his friends, and a native English speaker would naturally assume the man's full name to be Frederick, but it could just as well be Fredo, Alfred, Fritz, Elfred, Wilfred, Godfred, or various spellings thereof. Freddy could have been a middle name, the man's first name only used in a more official capacity, like Sir Victor Goddard, whose first name is actually Robert. Perhaps decades of time eroded memories, inadvertently distorting the last name of Johnson or Jackman or Hickson into Jackson. Indeed, though a dearth of records, something that could be explained by destruction in wartime, natural disaster, or human absent-mindedness, may suggest a man's non-existence, it does not prove it. To drive the point further, investigator Nick Ratneeks points out his own attempt at a similar search for early records of Sir Victor Goddard, a man who would eventually become one of England's most famous and colorful RAF officers, which was even more fruitless. When and where was the photo taken? There also seems to be some confusion as to when and where the photograph was taken, which may actually have some bearing on its veracity. Many articles suggest the location was RNAS Leon Solent, known after 1939 as HMS Daedalus, which, despite what the name would suggest, was not in fact a ship, but a naval air station. However, the rather lengthy description given by Sir Victor Goddard places the location of the photo at RAF Cranwell, some 200 miles to the north. 
Both Goddard and Bobby Capel are quite adamant that the photo was taken around Armistice Day, November 11th. Most sources indicate the photo was taken in 1919, while a few seem to believe the correct year was 1918. Goddard's writings only state the photo was taken at the time of Armistice after the First World War. This could be interpreted as the actual armistice, the 11th of November 1918, or the anniversary of the armistice during the following year. A post-war date is somewhat more plausible, as the photo was taken as a memento before the squadron disbanded. A period of time after the war's conclusion would be needed to wind down the military buildup that had occurred for the previous four to five years, and Armistice Day would be fittingly symbolic. Could the photo be a fraud? There is no way to really prove someone did not tamper with the photo before or after its delivery to the personnel at Cranwell. This possibility exists even if every other aspect of the story preceding the photo is accurate. It is exceedingly unlikely any tampering was performed by Bassano Studio. Even in that early era, the studio had a nationally recognized reputation, its founder, Alexander Bassano, a highly regarded photographer for British high society and the royal family. Many of the studio's images are currently held in the National Portrait Gallery in London. Blake Smith suggests the possibility that the image of Freddie Jackson was the result of a crude copy and paste of the airmen standing directly to the left. How similar the two faces are is purely a matter of opinion, and as Mr. Smith himself admits, the amount of contrast manipulation required to blend the two together renders the idea toothless. A fraud perpetrated at a much later time is also very unlikely. Sir Goddard described the photo in great detail, though not until 1975. It is possible the description was nothing more than a flight of fantasy that some intrepid hoaxer acted upon. However, multiple copies of the anomalous photo had already been produced, at least one of which landed in the hands of Bobby Capel, who was clear in her recollection of the photo after it was first pinned up, which was no later than 1919. At the time, she claimed to have immediately recognized the strange image as that of Jackson. Recall also that Capel is the original source for the photo to reach mass media. Unless we are willing to accuse Miss Capel of being the perpetrator of a fraud herself, there is simply no reason to consider any trickery by any party involved. It has been suggested that an unusual photographic error was responsible for the unexplained face. A man standing behind the top row may have inadvertently moved into shadow during exposure, perhaps dropping his cap in the process. Perhaps someone in the frame moved their head and created a ghosted image while the shutter was open. There are two main problems with any theory that tries to explain the photo as an unintentional error. The anomalous image is completely localized. No bleed or blur can be seen in any other area. In fact, other than being slightly less distinct than the man next to him, the obscured face of Freddie Jackson is itself free of blur, suggesting it, like everyone else in the photo, was not in motion during exposure. If the face belongs to someone other than Freddie Jackson, and is of a squadron member out of uniform, why was he either A. recognized as Freddie Jackson by the other participants, or B. not immediately forthcoming as being the source of all the consternation? If there really was a Freddie Jackson, and if all parties are to be believed, we seem to have a genuine mystery on our hands. No one can say the original image wasn't doctored, but such would seem to be a rather pointless prank. Even the darkest sense of humor would probably not make light of a young man being obliterated in the mist of blood and gore. Perhaps a man who resembled Freddie Jackson showed up late for the photo and forgot his hat. Or perhaps Freddie Jackson showed up for one last photo with his comrades before continuing on his great adventure. We will likely never know.